er ist Professor, Junior, Junior Prof. Ja, das ist ein junger Professor hier an der Universität. Es ist also nicht nur so, dass hier heute NachwuchswissenschaftlerInnen antreten, sondern auch Leute, die schon mitten im akademischen Alltag angekommen sind. Und er ist tatsächlich nicht nur Professor, er ist auch ein gebürtiger Brite. Das heißt, ja, jetzt illegal hier, <lacht> weiß ich nicht. Wir, wir sind trotzdem froh, dass er da ist, dass er immer noch da ist. Ein erster Auftritt jetzt nach dem Wochenende, deswegen nochmal ein extra warm welcome for our dear guest, Dave, David Epson, meine Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen. So, um, okay, settle down, I only have 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> So I have hamsters, they're not on fire. Um, contrary to what it might look like, the hamster on the right isn't dead, it's resting in a nice, sustainable way. Um, <laughs> the second point I want to make is I see a number of my students in the audience, and I just want you to consider that I haven't yet marked your essays, so when you're applauding, bear that in mind. Um, <laughs> so what I'd like to talk to you about today is this uh, dominant discourse in uh, food sustainability science of this notion of sustainable intensification. And that's basically the idea that you can have more of this stuff on the left in order to achieve this thing on the right. And I'm somewhat skeptical that we can really do that. So um, let's start with a definition of what we mean by sustainable intensification. Largely the way that this concept is being described is that if we increase the yield on existing farmland, we can produce more food, feed more people, and that means that there'll be land spared from being converted to agriculture and we can have more biodiversity. It's a relatively simple idea, um, and it's an idea which is increasingly popular, so you now you can fill up a relatively small bookshelf, at least, with, the, with these books on sustainable intensification. And you'll notice there's one book in there which isn't about sustainable intensification. Now, I should have probably um, had the original German version of this quote from Momo, but I was in haste, and I didn't do that. But I really like it. So, all the world's misfortunes stemmed from the... Um, the countless untruths which people um, told because of haste or carelessness. And my argument here is that sustainable intensification is essentially an idea which has been developed in haste and is careless. So, um, something about where this idea came from. So, as you can see, it uh, was bobbled about with a few people writing papers on this concept in the uh, late 90s, and suddenly there was an explosion from about 2007, and now we have hundreds of these papers published each year in this lovely sustainable growth uh, paradigm. So, the original people writing about sustainable intensification were actually writing about sustainable smallholder intensification in Africa. And they were largely social scientists and they were largely doing thoughtful, intelligent research. Um, in 2005, a paper was published in Science, I think it was, um, by um, uh, a number of well-respected researchers from Cambridge University, uh, Andrew Bamford and colleagues, called Land Sparing. Um, and this really was the uh, motivation for this explosion of research into sustainable intensification. So I want to just explain a little bit about um, what they thought and why I find that problematic. Um, so their basic idea was that land provides two things that we care about. Land provides biodiversity and land provides food. And there's some kind of trade-off between these uh, two goods that we might desire. Their second assumption was um, that there are basically two ways of um, allocating resources, land, to either food production or um, biodiversity protection. And so the first of those is something called land uh, sharing, or land sparing, sorry. Land sparing is basically the idea that you intensively produce food in a small area, and that allows you to um, spare land elsewhere for biodiversity conservation. And this is an accurate picture of the type of biodiversity that you might conserve. Um, you can tell that I'm not an ecologist. Well, actually, I'm a bit of an ecologist. Um, the second option is um, land sharing. And land sharing, basically the idea that rather than separate food production and biodiversity, we should try and have land which provides both of those things at once. So you have a, a lower yield over a larger area, but you also have biodiversity which coexists with farming. 
Um, so this was their new idea. Not really such a new idea. So this idea of trade-offs between, between two potential goods for a fixed resource has been about in economics since at least the 1930s. And essentially, it's described in terms of this thing called a production possibility frontier. And this is the idea that there's a trade-off between these two goods. So in this case, uh, biodiversity on the one axis and food production on the other. And that we're probably inefficient. And therefore, we can increase both the amount of biodiversity we have and the amount of um, food we produce. And at some point, there's an efficient frontier. So there's a point at which there's always a trade-off between providing one of those goods and the other. So it's a, it's a relatively simple idea. I would argue that actually um, there aren't the only two things we care about from land production. We also care about providing livelihoods for people. We, compare, we care about things like uh, cultural identity. We care about ecosystem services, climate regulation. But let's just imagine there are two things we care about. Let's also imagine that we can, bear, we can um, understand food production just in terms of uh, kilograms. So one kilogram of organic strawberries has exactly the same value as one kilogram of um, fodder beet. Um, that's also a questionable assumption. And that biodiversity can be measured with one number, which everyone agrees about. But a simple model which we can use to understand which option is best, land sparing or land sharing. So we have this uh, simple model. What can possibly go wrong? Well, we can get people who don't really understand simple models. This is a, a now famous paper, which was written in 2013 by people who I actually know, so I shouldn't be too rude about them, but I will. Um, They've taken this prediction, uh, production possibility frontier model, and they've done it wrong. So a couple of things they've done wrong. They make the assumption that actually, if you have low impacts on the environment, you have high food production. And if you have um, high impacts on the environment, you have low food production. That's not quite right. Um, the second thing they've done slightly wrong is the assumption that the amount of food we need um, is a function of the amount of environmental impacts we have. That's nonsense. And the third and most important problem is this black dot which says where we currently are, in other words, we're not producing enough food and we have too many environmental problems, um, is wrong, at least in the first case. So a recent study from 2018 suggests that globally we produce something like 6,000 calories per person per day in food which could be consumed by humans. We do not have a problem of not producing enough food. This is simply a wrong starting point for these conversations. So um, this paper has been cited almost a thousand times. What the fridge? Um, and it's not often that economists, and I'm somewhat an economist, get to be smug about other people's terrible models of the world. Um, but in this case, I think we really can. But going back to this argument that we have essentially two choices in the world of how to manage uh, land. We can either have land sparing or land sharing, so now it's a fight. And who wins that fight? Well, if you look at the literature, largely we would argue the answer is it depends. In some landscapes, land sparing is better. In some landscapes, land sharing is better. Um, what the sustainable um, intensity people say is no, <laughs> land sparing is always better. And they give birth to this wonderful new idea. We have a new baby. It's growing. Everyone's happy. Um, so why might this be problematic? Um, so first is this notion that we must intensify. Brilliant new idea. Well done, scientists. Um, we've been intensifying food production for at least 100 years um, and really increasing food production massively um, per hectare for the last 70 or 80 years, as you can see from these graphs. In that time, we've seen a dramatic decline in biodiversity, many different measures, and we've seen some improvement in terms of food security, but we still have this kind of stubborn problem of almost a billion people who are undernourished um, or living in hunger. So Einstein had this uh, idea that insanity is the idea of doing the same thing again and again, expecting a different result. So I'm somewhat puzzled why we expect sustainable intensification now suddenly to be sustainable and solve these problems. Um, so then the other problem that kind of occurs to me in terms of sustainable intensification is we seem to be confusing scientists and wizards a little bit here. Um, now, if you look at Google images, which I do a lot um, for these two things, then you'll see that actually there's a lot of similarity between um, scientists and wizards, both old white men with beards, which is reassuring for me as a scientist. Um, 
but they're also slightly different from each other in the sense that um, scientists are supposed to understand things like evidence and um, causation between an action and a response, not magic. And the idea that somehow if you intensify produced, intensively produce food in one place, land will magically be spared for biodiversity elsewhere is simply that. There is no evidence at all that uh, intensified production leads to uh, greater conservation. So um, if you like magic, sustainable intensification is for you. Um, <laughs> And this relates to another problem called the partial equilibrium problem. And so this is the way that these uh, smart scientists, and you can tell this is a smart scientist, because if you Google his image, you get this intelligent looking picture of him standing with greenery and talking to an audience. Um, if you Google pictures of me, generally this is what comes up. Um, <laughs> so maybe I'm not the best authority on these sort of things. However, essentially what they do is they take a single landscape and they measure the biodiversity, they measure the yield, and they take another landscape, they do the same thing, and they come up with some model about which of these things is best. Now, from an ecological perspective, that kind of makes sense. If you have more birds in um, Lower Saxony, it doesn't affect how many birds you have in the Brazilian rainforest. However, when it comes to food production, if you change something in the global food production here, it has an impact somewhere else in the world. And um, this is also not a new idea. So this is Stanley Jevons, worked on the coal problem in 1866, I think. And his basic idea was, why, if we're using a resource more efficiently, are we using more of that resource rather than less? Because as we figure out a way of being more efficient, um, then we actually lower the cost and we increase the demand. So I do not believe that sustainable intensification is a solution to our problems. I do believe it has a potential role to play. The fundamental problem is we make the assumption that it's inherently good in its own right, and we just need to also have people who think about governance um, and all these other things which matter in conjunction with sustainable intensification. And my argument is actually what we need to do is think about sustainability as a process. We can increase food production, but it's only sustainable if we have the right types of policy in place the right types of lenses to think about distribution and procedural justice in order to make sure that food feeds people and it doesn't just lead to um, growth in food production, which we don't need. So, um, thank you.